Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm sorry. I was uh, trying to find our guest of honor who has just arrived. John, can you hear me? Unmuted. Okay. <laughs> Hi, John. Uh, you have a Hello. you have you have an audience who's uh, ready and willing to listen to your your. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic session. I know we had a preview, so we had a uh, a glimpse into what's coming. And uh, uh, go ahead and uh, you you can share your screen now, John. Okay, let me let me do that. Um, I'm going to share. Let me share this. See how that works. Okay, I'm able to see that in the uh, speaker's view. There you go. And uh, if, 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 you're, if you're ready, John, we are at the uh, 1030 mark. And uh, I, I just want okay. to I want to give you I want to give you an intro, though, John. You, you have a well-deserved intro coming. OK, it, it, I'm going to okay. take, make I'm, it short. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take away from a half an hour. I'm going to truncate it into five because it's, it's very impressive. Um, so okay. today, we're be, today, today we're going to be talking about the beliefs about the causes of safety. What do safety professionals think? Uh, John is the Gordon Kaufman Professor of Management Emeritus uh, and a professor post-tenure of work and organization studies at the MIT Sloan of School, School of Management. He was also the Professor of Engineering Systems until 2015 and served as co-chair of the director of MIT's Lean Advancement Initiative from 2003 to 2013. John is an excellent source uh, for information on individual and group decision making with a focus on its relationship to organizational learning and change practices, such as self-assessment and root cause analysis, which is near and dear to my heart. His recent work focuses on industries that manage significant hazards, such as nuclear power, petrochemical, and healthcare. He has examined the uh, relationships among leadership, management philosophies, teamwork, mental models, safety culture, and human performance improvement, which is quite a, a niche and uh, you know very specific to what we want to hear today. Uh, today, John will uh, lead the discussion about insights gained from two surveys uh, from the former HPRCT conference, the last live one, I believe, in 2019. Um, and he, he surveyed the members asking for beliefs about the causes of safety and identifying sources of variation associated with demographic demographic characteristics, work experience, and cognitive style. So this is going to uh, prove to be a very interesting, uh, like I said, I've had a preview, so I know what's coming, and it's uh, going to be uh, extremely thought-provoking. So with that, I will turn it over to you, John. Okay, thanks. Uh, so um, I would like this to be an interactive session. The uh, problem I have right now is that I'm seeing my slides, but I am not seeing the audience. So if somebody wants to, um, at, you know, without my messing up time and trying to figure out how to see you better, if someone wants to raise a hand or speak, um, I would suggest that you unmute yourself and, and ask your question or, um, Bob, if you if you want, an alternative is for you to act as yeah. um, moderator here. And if so, if you can see everybody and somebody raises a hand, you can feel free to interrupt me. Yeah, I, I, I will uh, absolutely be the moderator on this, John. And uh, people, uh, go ahead. If you have any questions, use the chat, and uh, okay. and, and I will uh, interrupt as need be. Uh, thanks for uh, agreeing to take questions as you go, John. That'll that'll work fine. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, then I'll just swing into this. Um, this lists some of my co-authors who've been at MIT, have been students or uh, postdocs and so forth. But um, we, uh, we really have been interested, I've been interested a long time about how people think very differently about safety. Uh, it seems like we ought to all just know how to do this. But in fact, uh, we're, we're making it up as we go along, and we've been doing that for a long time. Uh, if you go back historically, uh, you can see 100 years ago, um, 150 years ago, people mostly thought that safety issues were um, 
you know, left to uh, to chance or to uh, divine intervention. That if if something went wrong, an accident happened, it was fate. Uh, and then attention turned to design flaws. That how we build things and uh, the equipment we use. Uh, and and then human error became uh, the major concern. Whose fault is this? Who made a mistake? Uh, is that the source of error? And most recently, over the past 20 or so years, 30 years, um, we've focused uh, more and more on organizational and management factors. Uh, and that kind of variability is reflected as well in the way that we uh, deal with incident investigations and in design practices. How do you build safer um, work settings, um, both from a engineering viewpoint, uh, from an ergonomic viewpoint, and so forth. So there's a long list of different approaches, theories. Some are more mathematical, some are more logical. Um, and as we uh, you know, think about how we bring our understanding to the problem of safety, a lot of those understandings I would see as social constructions. We, we build them. We've made them up. Um, and the ones that work seem uh, or, or seem more useful get spread around, uh, but there's always new ideas coming along. And um, uh, at the same time, there are critiques of much of what we do. It's, it's easy to, to, to be a, a, a critic since uh, accidents continue to happen, and being a critic is easier than, than actually being uh, someone responsible for running the uh, the operations and and feeling responsibility over the the you know the consequences of accidents so you know um, is that variation a bad thing variation over time variation by industry country company profession uh, person to person is that a bad thing uh, and we should all come to agree on a single theory of of safety that we can move forward with together, or perhaps in our stage of, um, of knowledge, is variation to be more expected and maybe is a good thing, uh, could be a source of um, innovation and learning. So that's uh, the, the question I, that underlies the research that we did is whether this variation can be understood, characterized in some way, and maybe it's a useful variation, or at least some of it is useful. So uh, here's just a couple of quotations illustrating some of the value or potential value of diversity from you know, Jim Reason, that we as humans uh, are very adaptable and, and uh, flexible, and therefore we're able to uh, create safety. We're able to manage problems in a very dynamic and uncertain world. And if you constrain the human to only follow the rules, for example, then maybe we're actually losing something uh, in that uniquely human ability to react to a situation that can't be perfectly predicted and perfectly written into the rules. Uh, Susan Silby at MIT, my colleague, has uh, said uh, many engineering models, many, the ways engineers think about engineered systems, you know, it may not really describe the way work is really done. Instead, it's a kind of imaginary account of, uh, you know, an, in principle, uh, scientific account, but it doesn't correspond uh, necessarily to the way work and, uh, and systems of uh, socio-technical systems of work and organizations really perform. Carl Weick um, talked about, uh, you know, the, one of the founders of the high reliability organizing movement, that as we develop more ways of talking about and, and believing and seeing the world around us, we begin to see more and understand more and have more ways of approaching a problem. So does that mean variation? should be cherished and you know appreciated or does that mean variation should be limited and uh, you know we should all come to some agreements well that's part of what underlies our research and you know first we're going to start out we thought we would start out by trying to understand 
what is the variation out there? You know, is there as much variation as we think or as we see, or maybe, maybe we're mistaken? Uh, we are definitely not looking for a new theory. We're just trying to understand the variation among the theories or ways of, uh, of working, the intuitive theories that people have and are working with. And um, certainly, uh, you know, in, in trying to characterize variation, we want to have enough richness in our categories to, uh, to understand differences and, and important differences, um, but not so many that it's overwhelming. So on the one hand, you've got, let's say, a Mort checklist that's got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of specific causes of a safety event. That's uh, just too big a checklist to be very useful. Uh, on the other hand, you've got distinctions like, um, you know, technology versus human versus organization, which is so abstract that by itself, it's, it's not very useful. Uh, so we are looking for something in between. Uh, some set of basic categories, as, you know, a, a, a small but meaningful number of uh, causal ideas that seem to capture the way that, that experienced professionals, so folks like yourselves, would think and talk about safety and about accidents. And if we had a way of, of uh, mapping that kind of uh, variation, where does the variation come from? Is it from work experience that uh, certain professions or certain industries or certain countries have different ways of thinking about safety than others? Is it about personality? That different kinds of people have different ways of thinking about safety. So we wanted to uh, not only characterize the variation, but understand something about the sources of variation. So we design first, you know, a, a, um, a survey. This research certainly could have been approached in other ways, um, but we thought we would ask people who are actively working in the safety world in a range of industries. And, and we had cooperation from the leadership of, of the uh, HPRCT organization, now CHOL, and that gave us access to a pretty large mailing list, although um, a smaller number of people act, tend to open those um, mailers and uh, newsletters and so forth. So, you know, hundreds or possibly thousands of safety professionals, managers, consultants in a safety relevant uh, in industries. Um, and we offered, uh, anyone who was willing to fill out our survey. Some of you may have been respondents in this um, research uh, two years ago. Now, I think three years ago, um, respondents were offered to find out about the results uh, and they were offered a copy of a chapter I had written uh, in a book and they were offered a possibility of getting a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. Uh, we gave out five for each of the two surveys. So the first survey was one where we, we did not know what people would say. Uh, we wanted to give them an opportunity to, to talk about their ideas of safety and what led to safety or what undermined safety and caused accidents in, in any way they wanted. So we designed a more open-ended uh, survey that looked more like an interview, except that you know the interviewer wasn't there. And we asked about the key factors or prerequisites of safety and we asked about their background information. Then using the results of survey one, we coded them into a set of cause categories. And we then created a closed ended checklist in survey two, where respondents could then pick from a list uh, which of the causes or cause categories they thought were more important and to give us, uh, again, their, some background information. So the rest of today, I'm going to give you, you know, more, a little more detail on the surveys and some of our results, and then talk about what it means. So in survey number one, we, we realized that this was actually quite a difficult task. And we 
wanted to uh, ask about causes in a couple of different ways and see what could work. Um, the first question, probably the key question is uh, to say, and we, we introduced it by saying this is hard to answer, but from your experience, what are the most important key factors or prerequisites that contribute to creating and maintaining a high level of safety? And if they're not there, we're going to get near misses, accidents, disasters, so forth. And we, I, I, John, John, can I interrupt you just for a second? Uh, the uh, the attendees are seeing the speaker's view. Uh, could you put that uh, to the screen that has the full view? Oh, they're seeing the speaker's view. All right, let me try. I'm going to have to. Uh... All right, let me stop the sharing. Okay, let's try doing it this way. Okay, and once you get yeah, once you get that screen, you can just go to full view. Now, is that doing the same thing? Yeah. Are you are you seeing the full screen now or not? No, we're saying your speaker notes. Yeah. All right. All right. You know that when I go into That, that, that's a that's a much clearer inadequate yeah okay thank you john didn't mean to interrupt no that's that's fine you know, i can try to get as, as much of that as i can on the screen okay okay thank um, you yeah all right thanks and feel free to interrupt for any reason but anyway so you know we asked them to list three to ten of these reasons and i'll give you you know data most people listed three four five six some as much as ten but this list three to 10, uh, we then asked in the second question, uh, which of these was their most important one? And uh, what was their second most important and third? And for those top three, we asked, okay, what did you think created or sustained that factor? What's a cause of the cause? So if, for example, on the first question, they said something like, um, uh, that, that workers should be aware of risks. Uh, we would then in the second question, if that was their most important cause, we would say, oh, okay, uh, what is it that leads workers, you know, why are workers aware of this? And they might put something like uh, safety culture or leaders um, uh, are championing safety or training or you know, root cause analysis or whatever as a, as a cause that, that underlies that important factor. And uh, in the third you know, question, we were saying, well, you know, as you've been answering these questions, which are hard, you might be thinking, well, it depends. I can't just answer that question. Give me more data. And so we tried to get them to help us understand what it depended on. You know, give us an example of something that might, it might depend on. Um, and finally, we asked, you know, can you think of a successful, safe organization and one maybe that's not so safe and what's different about them? So we tried to create a lot of different ways to think about and, and tell us about what is important in safety. And, and of these four, I think people got tired working through these, frankly. So the answers to question one were the most complete and the most useful. People got, you know, gave us less and less as we went through and they were repeating themselves a great deal. So much of the focus of our uh, coding was on the first question. We also asked them to give us their age, gender, birthplace, education, work experience, current job, past jobs, you know, what their level of responsibility was, how many hours a week they work on safety, what industries they've been in uh, now and in the past, and what countries they've worked in for significant amounts of time. Uh, and finally, we, we gave them a, 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 a cognitive style or personality measure called need for closure that we thought might be useful. Turned out it wasn't, but we thought it might be. Uh, and it's one that, um, that asks about, <laughs> pardon, <laughs> oh, any, and just uh, 
how much do you want there to be answers? You know, how much do you want certainty rather than a willingness to tolerate a kind of uncertainty, ambiguity, you know, having more questions than answers? So there are six items on that with uh, a scale to answer, agree, disagree. That's uh, questions like the following. Generally, I don't search for an alternative solution to problems for which I already have a solution available. So, you know, for example, if uh, you come into some problem in the workplace, a safety issue, and, and a worker didn't um, do something right, and, and you have the solution, which is training, okay, let's give them training. That's fine, that's the answer, we know what to do. I'm not gonna look for other solutions uh, uh, to, to figure this out because I've got one ready at hand. Um, John, just real quick, it, uh, it, your head is cut off and we're not seeing your smiling face. Oh, all right. There we go. Is that, have you got me now? Okay. We got you now, we can see your smiling face. Okay. Thank you, John. Thanks. Uh, just for your curiosity, this is a, a heat map of where people, uh, uh, where our respondents came from on the first survey. Uh, so as you can see, mostly the US, uh, but uh, sprinkled around quite a number of places, um, including South Korea, uh, Philippines, Australia, you know, Peru, uh, just a few here and there, but mostly mostly US centric. And, if, and uh, maybe more Canadians than any other particular country. Um, we had 90 respondents. We had actually 134 who started the, the survey, but many of them gave up <laughs> during it. Uh, it was a you know, fairly long survey, probably took people 30 to 60 minutes to answer. And um, of the 90 respondents that pretty much finished enough of the questions that we could code their answers, Two thirds were male. The median age is 46 to 55. Uh, 40 over 40 percent had a graduate degree of some sort. The two major industries represented were power generation and oil and gas. Uh, and uh, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what were people saying in their answers to the cause question. You know, what is it that leads to supports safety? We got out of those 90 respondents, 419 responses. So, you know, three or more from everybody, averaging almost five per person. Uh, this, I, I hope this is readable to you, um, but it gives you the, uh, this is the top 15 causes. We ended up with 36 categories from those 419 responses. And these are ordered by the percentage of the respondents who gave a cause category in their top three. So leaders visibly champion safety was our coding category of which about one in six um, respondents gave that in their top three. And an example quote is, strong visible support for safety from leadership. So that's something someone read, wrote into the, their response uh, to, to this. And we coded that as leaders visibly champion safety. Um, and as you can see, there's, there's quite a variety of things um, in this top 15, um, but even, even the most frequent leaders visibly champion safety there, there wasn't a consensus on the top, you know, what is most important or what's in the top three. And um, as you can see from the next four to 10 column, uh, even the most frequently mentioned causes in our list are mentioned by only 20 to 25% of people. So a good example of that is down about six or so down is fairness, avoid blaming individuals. You know, and a sample quote was senior leaders immediately assign blame to any failure. Well, 12% of people listed that in their top three. Another 14% listed it in their next four to 10. Uh, you know, if they gave more than three responses, they might have given up to 10. Most people averaged four or five. Um, so the fairness is an example of something that was given quite often, but not so often in the top three. 
this kind of avoid blank. Um, and, you know, so if you, the third column, that cause index, was our attempt to um, add up together uh, how often people were saying something in that category, uh, giving more points to saying it in the top three and fewer points to saying it in the next four to 10 and allowing it to be counted more times. So if more than once. So if, some, if someone said leaders visibly champion safety and then said top leadership uh, pro, uh, you know, is, is out talking about safety and they said both of those as causes, we'd code them into the same category. Uh, they would count twice in the cause index, but they only count once uh, in, the, uh, in the percent in top three or percent in next four to 10. So that's you know, a way to try to understand how frequent things are, but also not to, not to double, triple count, or at least to know if we're double, triple counting someone who's saying the same thing or some, something very similar over and over again. So, you know, this is a lot to assimilate, but it's, you know, 15 out of our, uh, our top group. And, um, all right, let me get to why I'm, it's not allowing me to, great. There we go. Okay. Uh, so this down the left is the rest of those 36 cause categories. Um, you know, shared understanding, mutual trust and respect, peer influence, procedure quality, root cause investigation, and so forth. When we looked over all of our responses, we thought that what was there was very interesting, but we also thought there were some things that were missing. Uh, as we thought about what our understanding of the literature, our experience in several of these industries, what would, number one, what was missing is factors external to the focal organization, such as, you know, the, the industry and market that they're in, the legal system they're under, the regulatory uh, requirements, the relationships with you know, a web of contractors and suppliers, the, the focus of the responses of our, um, you know, our survey uh, respondents was very much on an organization, like a, uh, you know, an oil drilling platform or um, maybe an oil company or a uh, electric uh, utility uh, or a hospital and so forth, um, or construction company. So it was on the company, not on the environment, the both, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of field of organizations and, and uh, institutions that surround the organization. And it also wasn't on a lot about the supply chain of uh, how uh, materials and people and ideas come into that organization. Uh, very few of the respondents talked about multiple stakeholders who might be in conflict. Uh, so for example, the status and authority of the safety organization vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, you know, the line managers and operating organization. Uh, that was mentioned a couple of times, but not very often. Uh, there was nothing explicitly about teamwork or collaboration in there. So we decided that we would try to create a second survey uh, and we would take the causes that we derived here, but we'd add, we took 36 causes, we added six new ones based around these things in the right-hand column. And that brought a total of 42 causes. And before we get to that survey, I just wanna mention that we, we also um, looked at the other questions in survey one. Uh, the cause of cause question was very difficult. A lot of respondents tended to just kind of reiterate what they'd said. They would give an example or a related cause. They didn't really give what we were hoping would be a cause of a cause, a kind of causal story or, or a you know, mental model of a linked set of causes. Um, and you know, most of the other questions we asked about what does it depend on or what distinguishes a good from a bad, 
company, there were few respondents and responses, and mostly it could be coded with the same causes that we've already gotten from the first question. Uh, hi, John. I, I have a couple of questions if you if you sure. Okay? sure. I yep. have from uh, from Brian Gestering. Uh, ap apologize if this is a stupid question, but <laughs> is it safety and leadership's best interest? Accidents slow down production operations. Uh, they incur cost and potential liability for treatment of injured workers and strain production operations as wor workers aren't working. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're asking my opinion, that's, you know, I can certainly give my opinion and I would say yes in the long run, although not necessarily in the short run. Um, and I can explain more on that if you'd like. But, you know, what I'm at, what I'm trying to identify here is what are the, you know, beliefs of the people who answered the survey and uh, indeed, leaders visibly champion safety, leaders set standards, monetary enforce, leaders listen and care about workers, leaders prioritize safety. It comes up a lot, but it's certainly not the only thing that's coming up. And as we will see in the second survey, we can get a, you know, a sense, you know, the second survey is going to allow us to move to a, a more parsimonious, a, a simpler and a more digestible model of what people are saying to us. So, you know, I just, for the purpose of this talk, I wanna separate my beliefs of what I think is right, the, you know, my model of safety from what everybody in who responded here are telling me are their models of safety. Okay, and the second question was from Tanya. It says, uh, were, were these missing categories in the initial list of causal factors? What were the initial list of calls? calls there, there were no, there were no list. There was no initial list. We just asked them an open-ended question. What do you think causes safety, supports safety? What are the key factors? So we left it open to them to write in on blank, you know, answers, what it, whatever they said. And then we took the 419 things they said, and we tried to sort them into categories based on how, you know, you know, initially it was similar because people would say leadership, leadership, we'd put those together, but then we would try to figure out the subtypes that they might have there or different things about leadership that they were saying or about safety culture. You know, people didn't use the same words. They had different, some were more abstract, some were more specific. Um, so we're trying. We were trying to capture the the different things that people were saying without putting words in their mouth, and and but without making it so complicated that we have 419 responses that don't help us understand anything. But we didn't give them a list in in uh, study one. In study two, we did. Study two, we gave them a list, and and that's the you know, that's the next step in this report to you. Okay, uh, John, I think what I'm going to do is I don't want to interrupt your flow. And I know that some of these questions are going to be answered when you do get to survey two. Uh, and then yeah. when, we get to, when we get to the questions and answers, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and just open up the mics and, and we can talk directly uh, during the Q&A. Sure. Okay, sure. Thank you. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, so just to close on this slide, uh, the background questions we asked of people, really didn't have much relationship that we could tell to uh, what people were saying. The, the strongest relationships were with experience variables, like those who'd worked in more industries or more countries or were older, or who spent more time in safety work, seemed to be saying something a little bit different. But um, we thought that the second survey, which would have more, would have a limited list of causes, would give us a better chance of finding these relationships. And we also hope to get more respondents. Remember, we only had 90 and they were saying very different things one to another. So we were hoping that with a larger number of subjects and a more limited set of responses, we'd be able to find more um, in the way of experience variables. So survey number two went back to the 
HPRCT mailing list, but also two of the uh, HPRCT leadership um, uh, volunteered their own personal mailing lists. So we sent to them as well to try to get more responses. And we uh, changed the, the survey a little bit. Now there was a list of 42 causes and you could pick uh, the five most important out of that list of 42 and then pick the five to 10 next most important. And for each of the top five that you picked, we ask that you give three to five connections with other causes. So, you know, from the list of 42, and, uh, uh, you know, let's say that um, leaders champion safety was your first most important, we would then ask you, okay, of, you know, what is linked to leaders champion safety? Um, what is it connected to? What does it cause? What causes it? What, you know, any kind of connection you want to have, the connection could be cause effect, it could be similarity, it could be an, one is an example of the other. Any connection you want to have, just tell us what connects to what in these 42 causes. So we would try to get them grouped together into a kind of more, you know, uh, more connected and, and maybe more uh, simpler uh, theory. Again, we uh, asked for demographic work experience, cognitive style measures. We added another cognitive style measure called the cognitive reflection test. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. And this time we got a hundred, we got some more respondents, not as many as we hoped for, but more. Uh, 196 started the survey, 131 pretty much finished it. 82% male. I, you know, I'd like to have more women in the survey, but this represents what the uh, industries we're talking about, you know, generally have. 82% uh, male, mean age 52. Again, about 40% have graduate degrees. And again, power generation and oil and gas are the most frequent industries that people are working in. Um, let me just tell you about the cognitive reflection test. In the last 10 years, this has become extraordinarily popular in the research community. The idea is to try to measure an, an ability or a tendency among people to stop and think and not give the immediately available answer that might be the wrong answer, but instead to think again about the problem. And um, there are several versions of this. Uh, some are more numerical, some are more logical. We used a, a seven item version that has both numerical and logical questions to it. So these are two of the seven questions. If it takes 10 seconds for 10 printers to print out 10 pages of paper, how many seconds will it take 50 printers to print out 50 pages of paper? And I would say uh, most people jump into the answer, they don't really think about it. They say, oh, it's 50 because they see the pattern. 10, 10, 10, 50, 50, what comes next? 50. Turns out 50 isn't the right answer. And if you stop and think about it, um, you would hopefully come to the conclusion that uh, it's actually 10 seconds. So if 10 printers print out 10 pages in 10 seconds, you know, 10 printers will print out 50 pages. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, 10, 10 printers will, take, will print out 10 pages. 50 printers will print out 50 pages of paper in, uh, now I've got myself going. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, I'm sorry, 10 seconds for 10 pages to print out 10 pages of paper. <sighs> 50 printers will print out 50 pages of paper in 10 seconds. I'm sorry. Emily's father has three daughters. This one's going to be easier for me right now. The first two are named April, but I, I'm giving you a good example of why it's not so easy to answer these. Emily's father has three daughters. The first two are named April and May. What's the third daughter's name? 
Uh, a lot of people say April, May, the third daughter must be June uh, because they see the pattern. April, May, okay, the father's named their third daughter June, but we know something else. Emily's father has three daughters, so Emily has to be one of the, the father's three daughters, and therefore the first two are M April and May, the third is Emily. So that one, again, is a, um, uh, if, if you think a, a second time about the problem, you come to the, the right answer. Now, um, okay, there we go. So, responses. The, again, down the left here, we've got um, the most popular categories. There were 42 categories. So this is showing only 15 of them. And it's arranged by the percentage who gave <coughs> responses in the top five. So about 30% of the um, respondents answered that leaders visibly champion safety was in one of their top five answers. And another 22% said it's, it wasn't in their top five, but it was somewhere between answer six and 10. Um, and uh, sorry, between six and 15, depending on how many answers they gave. And then this, this is the percentage who gave it in that link question. So about 50% that the causal connections question, about half of them said leaders visibly champion safety was connected to some other cause. And we again had a cause index. So, you know, it's a very complicated table, but it's giving you an idea about the most popular, most, you know, the causes people in general see as most important leaders, situational awareness, leaders to listen and care, risk hazard awareness, open communication, design of equipment, you know, frontline supervisors, commitment to safety, management leaders by example, all, you know, all reasonable all perfectly reasonable, no huge surprises here. Um, but, uh, you know, 42 categories, too much to be thinking about. Can we group them in some way? And we were hoping that the connections question would allow us to group causes. But in fact, we don't have enough data. The 42 by 42 causes, uh, you know, that's giving you well over 1,600 possible connections among causes. And with 130 people giving us three to five each, we just don't have enough data. So instead, we used our own experience, the research literature, uh, and we went to the connections question where we could to see whether there were certain uh, preferences of what was li linked or connected to what. So for example, if you think of training and education, so training education was one of our cause categories. How should we think of that? Is that something that's a safety resource provided by the organization? It's something the organization does to or for the workers to give them the training, give them the education so they would be safe? Or is it something the workforce has they are more like their competence. So the training education is something that the workforce carries around with them. It's theirs. And it's more related to competence than it's related to something like safety resources provided by the organization. So what we did is when we had categories like that that could belong in different ways, could be thought about in different ways, we went back to the connections uh, responses and we look to see are people more likely, are they more frequently connecting training education to safety resources or are they more frequently connecting it to things like worker competence? And it turned out in this case they were connecting it more often with worker competence. So we ended up making a more, you know, a shorter, more high order list of categories, which you see in the bold in the second column, there's 15 categories. And 
Um, those 15 categories summarize, or hopefully they capture a lot of what the 42 causes that we asked in, in survey number two were, uh, were providing. And they kind of group them together. Uh, and um, they themselves, those 15 categories, could be grouped into even more higher level categories, which we have the six of them, external leaders, organization, design, culture, execution. Now, we thought the abstract level categories, those six, are too abstract to, to really be meaningful but that the 15 categories might have a, a chance, you know, they, they might be a reasonable way to talk about causes that, that capture a lot of meaning, but they're not so many or so complicated that they're hard to use. So, so John, been, yeah, is there a question up? Yeah, I have a, a quick question that is sure. related to these higher order cause categories. It's from Tanya. Uh, did these higher order cause categories have the missing categories from before, such as supply chain, market forces, etc.? Yes, they, they do. So if you if you look to the right, um, the six new ones that we added are in italics. So um, so for example, teamwork and coordination with contractors is at the very bottom, and that has become a new the higher order category we called collaborative, but you could give it whatever label you'd like. And it consists of answers to those two. Those two went with each other in, in, for many of our respondents. And we, um, and both of those originated from us rather than from the, the survey one. So they were added into survey two. Those are two of the six that were added. And then three of the six that were added were regulatory, legal, and market, and they're all up there under external. As you can see from the cause index, about 1% of the uh, cause mentions are external. So that's pretty rare. The most frequent is this leader's champion category, which itself was made up out of four out of the 42 causes of, of survey number two. It was made up out of leaders champion, leaders prioritize safety, leaders set standards and monitor, and leaders lead by, you know, or managers lead by example. Those things seem to group together into the notion that leaders are championing. But that was different from the leaders care. So we had some other, in the, in the 42 categories, we had leaders care and listen to the workers, and we had Managers have good work relationships with the workforce. Those seem to go together into a category that was a bit distinct from the leader's champion. So the leader, the leader higher order abstract category split in this way into leader's champion and leader's care. And the, you know, causes that have to do with the organization, which are a very large set, they in turn split up into this three higher level categories in our analysis anyway, which had to do with safety resources, shared expectations, and corrective actions. And similarly, design had these two subparts and culture had the four subparts. So of the 15 causes, leaders champion was the number one. Um, this cultural routines, the safety routines and, and commitment, that was, uh, the second most important at 12%. Fairness, trust, and powered workforce were both next at 10% and so on. Risk aware workers were next at 9%. Um, so these are, you know, this is how we broke down the frequency and, and tried to create a more understandable, workable, practical set of, of categories. Um, I, I did have a follow-up on that, John, which says, uh, sure. could, could you consider a Delphi-type analysis asking the thought leaders in our field these questions to see their results? I, I would consider that. I think that would be a very reasonable thing to do. Um, I've been thinking about how to, how to move on from here. 
And you know what to do next to either validate or deepen or or test these in some way, or you know also to find out is there some you know what did, what do I believe is useful about knowing this, um, you know true or not, what can we do with it? So that's you know uh, that's part of what I'll talk about in the next couple of minutes. But I think a Delphi study would be a very reasonable thing to do. Okay, and uh, once again, John, uh, your your camera, we're getting the top of your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. It's a <laughs> okay, I'm I'm actually okay. Uh, there we go. Okay, so um, we look for predictors. What in the backgrounds of the people we were uh, who responded? What you know is different? And in fact, there were a number of things. We we don't have a real theory about this, but you know, there were some differences. Males tended to answer a little differently than females. Those born in the USA tended to be different. We just compared USA versus everybody else uh, because there were too few from other countries. You know, more educated people, those with the advanced degrees tended to, to give a couple of different, uh, be more frequently giving learning and design defenses as, as answers. The CRT, question did work to to find some differences and uh, industry there were some differences and the co content of the work those doing more safety oriented jobs were more focused on trust for example and I just to pursue this in a little more detail um, I just want to look at one result out of industry and one result out of the CRT the cognitive reflection test um, if you look at just returning to that list of 42 causes and look at the, the respondents who were in power generation and look at the respondents who were in oil and gas. We, we did this both looking, there were, by the way, about a dozen who were in both. So we looked at it either including them in both or excluding them. This one is excluding them. So this is 30 respondents in power generation, none of whom work also in oil and gas. The most frequent causal factors in their top five for the power generation group were leaders visibly champion safety, open communication and reporting, and engaged workforce. If you look at the oil and gas people, 34 respondents who work in oil and gas but do not work in power generation, the most frequent responses were workers' personal commitment to safety, risk hazard awareness and vigilance, frontline supervisors committed to safety. So just eyeballing them, it seemed to us that oil and gas had a focus on work and workers and power generation more on management and culture. So it seemed like a different, you know, way of, of looking at the organization, looking at safety, different emphasis, if you like, do we, you know, do we focus on the top and their impact down in, in creating a culture, which certainly then has an impact on the people below, or do we look first at the people below and say, you know, do they have the right competence and the right motivation? So that, you know, was an interesting, provocative kind of result. And then the CRT, um, we we did a little follow-up analysis where we looked at the um, who had mentioned one of the less frequently mentioned causes. So if you look at the 42 causes, um, the ones that were infrequent, so the ones at the bottom of the list, the bottom 12, they were given by seven or fewer respondents out of out of the 131 respondents. So they were pretty rare. So we asked the question, if, if a respondent gave any one of those 12 infrequent causes, and there were 35 respondents who gave at least one out of the infrequent causes. And we compared those 35 against 84 who never mentioned the infrequent causes. They only gave more popular causes. And you'll notice this doesn't quite add up to 131. It's because there were some people who stopped 
taking the questionnaire before they answered the CRT. So we don't have their CRT scores. But if we compare these two groups, the CRT scores are significantly higher among those who mentioned an infrequent cause against those who never did. So, you know, maybe it, I mean, it seems consistent with the idea that the high CRT scores are people who take a second look. They don't settle for the obvious answer to a question. And uh, therefore, um, they, uh, you know, are, are um, producing the less, ob the less obvious or less popular causes. Okay, so conclusions. What have we learned? A lot of variation out there. Even the most popular causes were given by a minority of people. You know, we think our list of 15 causes might be, a, might be useful in, in trying to capture something about how people are thinking about safety and accidents. There seem to be some interesting relationships among causal beliefs and some of these demographic work experience, industry, cognitive style, CRT kind of variables. We certainly see a, a familiar tension between consistency, that is we'd, we'd like to have everybody agree, uh, we'd like to have everybody know what uh, is important for safety, but also, uh, you know, there's a tension between that and, be, and exploring and learning and finding out new things. So, you know, variation might be unpleasant, it might be, you know, wasteful, it might be dead wrong. But on the other hand, maybe it could be beneficial for increasing awareness and, and prompting innovation if, you know, the circumstances are right. But of course, our study gives us no evidence for that. You have to turn to other research, other, you know, people's experience to see whether variation is, is valuable, not from this study. Um, but, you know, when you look at, at other work, uh, the notion of moving from bureaucratic to generative, from control to learning, becoming high reliability, safety too, now they all kind of share the idea that multiple interpretations, multiple viewpoints can be useful. And our sense is that multiple interpretations can be useful, but organizations have to have learning capabilities in order to make use of those multiple interpretations. Otherwise, it just produces conflict and disagreement and, you know, uh, wasted resources. So, you know, what kind of learning capabilities might be useful? Well, some of those learning capabilities might be within individuals. So if you have workers, managers, um, uh, you know, engineers, um, operators, you, your workforce, each person has some internal diversity. Maybe they can handle this kind of learning opportunity and multiple interpretations. Maybe they can handle it better. So for example, there's research showing that managers with international experience, that is those who've worked outside their own country for a significant period of time, are more effective at managing teams that are themselves diverse internationally. You know, maybe by analogy here, maybe the high CRT people are kind of internally diverse. They allow multiple answers to emerge and then decide among them. And maybe those high CRT people are better able to handle this kind of ambiguity and to encourage learning and innovation. We don't know the answer to that yet, but maybe that's a could be a fruitful area to move forward. What about cross-person diversity? What about forming teams or uh, you know having an organization that's more or less diverse? Well, uh, there is quite a lot of study of teams less so of organizations, but a lot of teams that uh, have different levels of diversity. And one good example, Anita Woolley and colleagues found that they, they had a team of experts 
um, who were each expert in different areas, uh, try to solve some problems. And they compared that to a team of generalists who didn't have the deep expertise, but knew a lot of different kind. They knew something about a bunch of different areas. And what they found is that if they just gave the bunch of problems to the team of specialized experts versus the team of generalized less expert, the team of experts did worse. Why did they do worse? Well, they, they had a lot of conflict over, you know, whose way of looking at the world was right and, uh, and so on. But if um, they ask each team to have a short discussion ahead of time about how they would plan to work together as a team, under those circumstances, they found the team of experts did better than the team of generalists. Uh, John? So, you know, so, you know, my view, just to conclude that, my view is that <coughs> just having diversity is an opportunity, but often is is not successful and may be counterproductive, but having the diversity and having a way to deal with the diversity, the learning capabilities, that might be uh, more, uh, more effective. Okay, sorry, question. Uh, uh, it's actually um, a, a statement from Mike Petrowski uh, that I think is pertinent here, it, but he's sure. saying, could, could also be that many, came, many of these individuals came from nuclear power or the nuclear Navy and uh, or military backgrounds, which offered that discipline, that that could have been a uniqueness. Yeah, uh, so it, 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 when you're talking about that in the case of our data here in studies one and two, is that is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yes. Yeah. So uh, indeed, uh, we, we know that some of the respondents worked in power generation. We did not ask specifically about nuclear versus so we, we only know that they, that we asked them to, to give their current industries that they were working in and past industries. And there were people who gave two, three, five, six, ten, you know, different industries that they'd worked in. Uh, some of those were military. Um, some of those were uh, power generation. Um, but um, we, we did not separately code, um, you know, a lot of people didn't say, we were, I was nuclear Navy, a few did, um, but certainly the majority of the uh, respondents were not in any one industry or, or the military. But I agree with you that the approach in the nuclear Navy or uh, nuclear power is very different from that in oil and gas or chemicals or construction, mining, um, you know, healthcare. We've got a lot of different industries that are at different stages or face different kinds of challenges around safety. So it's not surprising that there would be industry differences. Um, many of you, perhaps many of you on this um, Zoom call, uh, work in multiple industries. I, uh, you know, an interesting question is whether you change your terminology or change your emphasis uh, you know, or listen differently when you are in a different industry uh, and, and, and perhaps tailor your advice differently depending on what you know about the regulatory climate or the resource munificence uh, you know, of, that, uh, of that client of yours. Uh, so that's, you know, another way in which variation, you, you then become internally diverse because you can face, uh, you, you can interact with multiple diverse industries versus having an industry specialized consultant who knows that industry but doesn't know anything about another industry. So that, you know, that's another question as to how different the safety practices and the safety consulting practices might be from an industry to an industry like military or um, nuclear power. Okay. Um, so anyway, I, I'm not gonna go into this in any detail, 
but you know we're we're thinking about what we want to do next and i would certainly welcome any comments or thoughts that you have or uh, any curiosities or offers of access uh i you know we we would like to do some more research at this point not exactly sure what to do um i came out of the field uh, with COVID, you know, I haven't really been interacting with organizations face to face since then. Um, and I'd like to go, you know, get back and engaged and um, whether it's with surveys, interviews, in person, and so on, we've, we have some ideas of what to do next, but uh, I'm very much open to other opportunities and other uh, ideas from a creative and experienced group like yourselves. Brown, uh, so I'll stop at that point and take more questions if you have them. Yeah, this is a fa fascinating discussion and uh, the, the disparity of the findings between power gen and oil and gas, I, I know will be a uh, source of uh, some of these questions, but I wanna open it up to the, uh, to the attendees and you can unmute yourself uh, and if you have a specific question, and that way you take me out of the middle and your question not filtered, it goes right to uh, John. Uh, Steve, your your uh, your mic is on. So would you like to have a question? Well, I would like to at least to make the suggestion, have you considered collaborating with, say, the National Safety Council or DuPont, both of which do huge assessments of corporations and surveys and cultural looks? Is there a way to kind of cooperate with one of those two groups or similar to get a hold of some of their data to see if you can apply this lens to that? Uh, I think that's a good idea. I was thinking about um, getting a hold of industry publications, for example, and, and coding them, but working directly with an organization like that, Chemical Safety Board, the you know, Center for Offshore Safety, there are a lot of places like that that could be, you know, and we, we know people in some of those areas more closely than others, um, you know, would be a, a, a possibility uh, especially if they're doing regular, those that are doing regular surveys and would be willing to add some questions onto their survey back uh, basis. Uh, uh, you know, we've got uh, JACO in the healthcare uh, region, you know, so there, there are certainly a lot of these possibilities and that's, you know, it's a great, uh, it's a great suggestion for us. Yeah, I'll just will say, if you need any help with number crunching, give me a holler. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, T. Yeah, another another suggestion on that, John, from uh, I believe it was Elliot, is uh, AICHE, Center for Chemical uh, Process Safety. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and uh, so, so there is there is a question on here asking if this paper has been published uh, anywhere or these surveys. It is, it is under review right now. Okay. So. Um, the, it's it's certainly available. Anybody who wants a draft copy, I'd be happy to send. Uh, it's it's it was submitted in April. This is the nature of the uh, journal process. I've heard nothing since then. I was I decided in my own mind to give them 90 days, and then you know ask what's going on, guys. Um, but the journal review process can take months and months. Okay. So. Uh, as far as when it will be published and readily available, uh, aside from getting it from me, uh, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, anyone else want to unmic yourself and have a direct conversation and get rid of the middleman? Mr. Nails, you're looking awful comfortable out there. <laughs> Uh, I was just saying that Bob had any questions. Uh, Tanya, did you have any questions? Because you were very active in the uh, in the chat. Well, I just find this fascinating. I mean, I, I some of the I, I have no idea if the data is robust enough to make some of the conclusions that you had made. But oh my goodness, that would that would be remarkable if with this kind of information you can start to make these types of of conclusions. And I think. 
I encourage you strongly to go forward and, and try to see if you can get more people to to fill this stuff out. I, uh, I, if, you don't, if you don't mind my asking, what would be the kind of conclusion that would be most, you know, if we had the data behind it, what kind of conclusion would you find interesting and, and maybe useful in some way? Well, when when you were talking about the scores on the cognitive reflection test and the and and finding the less popular uh, causal factors, I like, that is amazing. Like I, you know, yeah. again, I I have no idea if the data is robust enough to make that kind of conclusion, but that would be stunning if that actually held some weight. Yeah. Well, statistically, it's there. You can argue about what my sample is a sample of. You know, this is. Right. The HPRCT people who, it's a particular organization, you know, a hundred people who answered uh, a, a survey and who are they and, you know, what does that mean? But statistically, right. the, re the results there. Um, if you're curious about the CRT, there's a lot of published work and, and you can quickly see what they're finding. Um, but it's, um, you know, we, we threw it in there because we thought it might work and and we did the same with need for closure need for closure in neither survey gave us nothing um but the crt did show some results fascinating well excellent work i loved it <laughs> well thank you thank you uh, but that, that, that uh, disparity john between power gen and uh and oil and gas because one one representing management culture and the other is the workers uh, under, you know, with your experience in those two industries, uh, where, where, how do you explain that difference offhand? Well, I, I'm certainly not the first person who's noticed industry level differences. Uh, so there's a really good book uh, uh, by a fellow named Rene Amalberti uh, in, in France who has talked about different safety regimes or different, you know, different ways industries organize themselves basically uh, depending on how important safety is and, and how, you know, how much resources they have. So, you know, he puts airlines and nuclear power in a different realm than any other industry, really. And oil and gas is, is kind of in the middle. Um, so it, it could be that uh, these represent different uh, levels of uh, commitment or, you know, resource involvement. I'm sorry, the, the lawn care people have just started up outside and you may hear a roar. I'm hearing a roar. But anyway, they always find the most important Zoom call I'm on and that's when they mow the lawn. Uh, never used to happen when I mowed the lawn. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I do think that uh, oil and gas is more bureaucratic and it's more of a battle uh, over how much is going to be put into safety. I, I spent 10 years working with BP in an executive education program at, at MIT. And um, I think that, you know, I saw a lot of development there, but I also saw within BP how different, different parts of BP were from, from all the acquisitions they'd made, the legacy cultures, the different countries in the world that they work in, the different, uh, you know, different units that they have. And the, the one part of BP that did not send people to our course was the drilling part. You know, yeah. so there was a lot of, within BP, there was a lot of autonomy. There was a lot of variation. Now, I haven't done similar work with Exxon, but everybody who talks about Exxon in the industry talks about them very differently that they're, they're much more of a, of a kind of consistent culture throughout that, that developed after the Valdez accident. Um, and BP talks about Exxon as, you know, like it was the Borg, or some, you know, something we, we wouldn't want to do that. We wouldn't want to be like them. Yeah. But, you know, that, that, your conclusions fit, at least with my experience, but that the uh, because when you look at where safety two and uh, uh, Hall Nagel and uh, safety safety differently are all taking hold is, is in the power generation side, uh, as opposed to the oil and gas side. So there, there's a lot more acceptance of, of these progressive safety movements in in that industry as opposed to uh, oil and gas 
where it, it is a, a, a more of a grassroots type of effort and it's led from the bottom yeah. up. So I, I that, think that so. I think, you know, so, so much of the oil and gas industry is still small contractors, small drilling, you know, or, or drilling or being in the extremes. Uh, you know, something like um, the deep sea drilling they're doing, this is experimental. This yeah. is this is not routine. And, um, you know, in contrast to, uh, let's say, nuclear power plants that have a, a very um, well understood and, and um, you know, it, it's very highly consistent from plant to plant. You have you have the nuclear steam generating system. It's the same one. Uh, and, and in, you know, in, in France, for example, they you know have very standardized units. In contrast to the way the industry began, where every utility decided they'd have one of everything because they didn't know what would work and they just wanted to try it all out. And then the net result is they can't learn easily from one from another because everything is unique and distinct. And then you move into healthcare and, and there's no consistency because every patient reacts differently to whatever you do to them. So uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the kind of inherent hazards and the inherent way that people go about thinking about um, safety is different from industry to industry, but, but even within industry like Exxon versus BP, it's different from company to company as well. So there's a lot of variation to be thought about. Uh, does anyone else have uh, questions? You want on mic? I just wanted to comment on what John said. I worked with Exxon for a number of years and I found them to be consistent across the board. I was in coal for a while and then briefly under their continental United States operations and then I didn't see a lot of difference in their expectations. I'm, uh, I'm hang on a second because I got I gotta close a window or something. They're right outside my window and I couldn't hear your question. Uh, uh, John, John, I think he was agreeing with you about Exxon. That oh, is okay. Of working with them, that it was uh, it was understood across the board, and it wasn't uh, there wasn't different variants where one division would be thinking differently, like you had mentioned about BP. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Bob. This is Elliot Wolf. I had a question for Dr. Carroll. Uh, yes. Sure. Go ahead, Elliot. Okay. So. Um, I work for a company called Camores. Uh, we're actually a spinoff from DuPont as of 2015. So long, long history and, and foundation of, of safety, process safety. Um, and I'd be interested in your perspective uh, from a kind of a management science academic standpoint where, you know, like someone like myself who has gone through a business school program or an MBA program and many leaders in our organization that receive, you know, business education. Where do you think their place is for understanding fundamentals around human performance? How errors and mistakes happen in organizations? Um, I was fortunate in the program that I went to at Carnegie Mellon that we had a former astronaut, Jay Apt, who taught a course on catastrophic risk management. And that was available to, um, you know, the MBA students that to better understand, you know, fault trees and, and uh, error management. Um, so I'm just curious because I don't know that all programs educate executives or, or leadership in that specific area and, and what your thoughts are and maybe yeah. what, um, Maybe, maybe what business school programs could do to sort of change the game so that our executives come in with a foundational level of understanding and it's just not all profitability, revenue, and reduced costs. Yeah. Great question. Well, that is a, um, you know, I would say it's a million dollar question, but nowadays a million dollars doesn't get you very much. Um, that's a, it's a big and important question that you're asking about business schools as well as about what's the right kind of background and, uh, or, you know, for 
executives in the modern age. Uh, and, and what do we mean by safety here? So, you know, if, if an executive is in a nuclear power uh, plant, uh, we understand that the safety we're talking about is about, you know, blowing things up, radioactivity, all that kind of stuff. But in, in many applications now, even in the world of finance, if, if someone screws up finances, um, you know, like Bernie Madoff managed to make money disappear from a lot of charities, um, you kill people with that. Uh, that's really, a, that's really safety too. Not in the way we usually think of it as physical, you know, or toxic substances or whatever, but it's, it damages a lot. So, you know, what should um, executives be thinking about and, and what constitutes effective and ethical leadership in current contexts? And, and I will say that on the whole, the MBA movement, I'm not sure has advanced that cause. Um, I so will... John, can I just intervene a little bit here? Sure. There's, there's a movie that I came across last year. I put it in the chat called Fishing with Dynamite uh -huh. from Darden University. Yeah. And their program might be one of the leaders in trying to get executives to change the way they're teaching MBAs. They, they, they nail it right on the head. Like they, their opening line is that, you know, we have all of these eager people starting their MBA, wanting to change the world. And in two years, we transform them into robots of this system that is crushing society. So they've, they've figured out that, you know, the, it is the MBA programs that are um, uh, instrumental in, in getting things going the wrong way. And, um, yeah. That's the, is that the, the, uh, that's the School of Business at University of Virginia, correct? Yes, it is. Yes. yes. And um, so, in, in I, addition I, to that, I, I just wanted to add that Margaret Heffernan might be another resource because she has been championing the thought that, you know what, I don't care that you were schooled at this one place or you had 10 years in this industry or whatever. When you are a culture acclimatized into an environment, your brain circuits have changed. You're not thinking the way you thought when you were trained in that school or you spent 10 years in that industry. Stop talking that, you, that you're drawing from that because you're not. You are thinking the way that everybody else around you is thinking. That's what we do. We acclimatize very quickly. And I think that might be another source that you can use in this type of research. Yeah. So there are a lot of voices within the academy. So we're, we're actually approaching the annual conference called the Academy of Management where all the business school faculty get together. And we, we always have sessions about ethical leadership, about the future of the MBA, about whether MBA training is, is creating, you know, people who are short term or out for profit or, you know, all of that. And, you know, are we helping the world or are we hindering the world? And, um, and there, are, there are universities that are choosing, there are business schools that are choosing to take a more ethical approach and to distinguish themselves. You know, it can be a competitive advantage. We hope that being ethical is a competitive advantage rather than being unethical is a competitive advantage. Although in our modern society, it's too much, too many opportunities for unethical, unethical behavior to be advantageous. Um, but those schools but, yeah. use case. Those schools use case studies for for all kinds of things. Yeah. Do they ever include case studies of senior management that had to deal with a, a Deepwater Horizon or a, a BP, yeah. you know, Bay City or Anything yeah. like that? Yeah, they do that. And, and again, it varies, uh, but you'll find lots of cases like that. How they're taught and what conclusions you take away from the case can vary. Uh, and how important that is. Is it, is it seen as, you know, one session out of 15? Um, or is it one that we keep coming back to? Is it, is it central to the, to the way that they're um, trying to, to train or teach? Uh, you know, our values seen as important or as a commodity. Um, I learned 
here recently that uh, in my part of the woods up here in Ohio, Cleveland Clinic actually uses professional actors, role players in critical situations. And they put all their doctors through training on how to deal with very traumatic uh, uh, information that has to be shared with families. Well, I, I would say Case Western would be one of the places that the business school there comes to mind as a place that is is taking a lot of this very seriously. So, you, you know, you might, given that you're in Cleveland, uh, you might you might look up what's going on over there. Um, well, I've, I've, I've looked at it. I've actually got the contact information uh, because they work with our law enforcement groups around the state too. But it just seems like it might have an application to MBAs. Yeah. If you if you were going to be into some forum that would allow you to say, hey, what about this? You know. Yeah. Well, I I would hope that MIT Sloan, where I'm at, is on the right end of things, and our our mission statement is very much you know that you can have any mission statement you want, but our mission statement is very much around you know creating principled leaders who and make the world a better place. And I think our research takes that pretty seriously, but many of our colleague business schools, uh, the focus is much more on finance, it's on profits and tends to focus, you know, like the, like the stock market tends to be on short-term quarterly returns and you don't privilege ethics if you are focused on your next quarter's returns. And that, that, and, uh, and, you know, that, that underlies what I was asked earlier about leaders uh, as well in, in um, short term, long term. Uh, if, you, if you don't think about the long term, then safety tends to, go, you know, to get less emphasis. Well, in, in my career, I've looked for ways to, to generate that significant emotional event that changes the mindset of senior management without them having to go through the significant emotional event. Yeah. And uh, something that's more of a, I guess, a Don Quixote quest. But, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have, we have a few more minutes. Uh, Brian, did you wanna uh, ask John a question? Yeah, just really quick, following up on my ignorant question before, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering still, isn't there a financial interest in actually doing the right thing? I've never thought that business will do the right thing because it's the right thing. And what I'll just send in the, in the group chat, within forensic science, there was an economist who actually did a very interesting paper where she was looking at the actual value of a DNA database hit and actually what the economic value is. So I'm just surprised in industry, and maybe it does, and again, it's my ignorance talking, but I'm just curious that there's no actuarialist that is actually looking at the risk associated, putting a numeric value with what the risk is for not tightening the Pfister valve or whatever happens. So you actually have a risk versus benefit analysis that you can look at. And maybe that's a dangerous way to look at safety because you never want to risk safety. It's always better from a safety point to not, not loosen yeah. or tighten the, the Pfister valve. But it just seems like there would be an economic analysis purely from economics saying that it makes sense to do this. So here, here's my sense of this. And, and I think you you know, probably get a lot of different answers from different people, but my sense is that the risk benefit analyses you're talking about are being done and they're being done well for certain kinds of investments. So when you have a statistical, you know, database on things like valve failures and you've got, you know, you know what your mean time between failures is and so on and you can determine, you know, should we invest in, um, in preventive maintenance or should we be doing corrective maintenance or should we redesign the system? And they can, they can do a calculation like that. So those you have at least the potential to determine what to do, but, you know, recognize that if you, if you down in the bowels of the organization are saying we need to, to do something to change our maintenance schedule to replace valves and whatever, and your boss or your boss's boss won't give you the budget for that, then you're you're stuck. So it's not just a matter, you know, it's a matter of what is going to be the um, what what people care about, 
higher up in the organization, it's not necessarily the same analysis you just produced. So what they're caring about may be that they have a certain budget to spend and they have certain people who are gonna be pleased by investments in one way or another. And it's more of a political, what's gonna be good for my career decision than it is a decision about what's good for the long-term interests of this organization and its safety record. So unfortunately, you know, the, the things that are really dragging people's decisions may not be that, that scientific analysis you're doing down there. Then you have the second problem that a lot of things don't lend themselves to that, um, that cost benefit analysis. There's a lot of uncertainties, a lot of unknowns as to what should be in the analysis and what the probabilities are and so on. So it becomes more of a matter of faith that if we put more into training, if we put more into preventive maintenance, if we do this redesign, it's the right thing to do. It looks like the right thing to do. Um, I believe in it, but you know, I can't produce a numerical analysis that tells you how much we'll save here. Um, or I could produce it, but it, you know, somebody else could produce 10 different variants that would show different things, depending on how you wanna tweak the numbers. So it's, you know, you can't, I, I don't think for, for a lot of these important decisions that you can always create a, a cost benefit analysis that's gonna work. Let me give one just quick one thing I learned from my involvement with a major oil and gas company. They had a risk matrix. You all know about risk matrices, right? They have a, and if you then plot the risks they assessed on the risk matrix, what you find is that there's a whole bunch, there's many more than you would expect if there was some even distribution of risks and probabilities. They all kind of line up just below the point in the risk matrix where you need to report them to the next higher level of authority. What does that mean? It means that people are estimating the risks in a way that is convenient and, you know, yeah, they think it's a risk, but Maybe they're, you know, underestimating it so they don't have to get in, into a big bureaucratic mess or become, you know, known as the troublemaker who keeps bringing up these problems that nobody else sees as a problem. Uh, what, what would BP have said was the, the possibility of blowing up, um, you know, Macondo before they blew it up? they probably would have said, oh no, we handle these all the time, everything's fine. And, and even if you point out to them that somebody just blew one up in Australia a couple of months ago, you know, they would say, well, that was them. You know, I guess they're no good at it. Whereas, you know, we're wonderful. Um, I do want so to point out quick, hard. are you familiar with Dr. Russ Acoff? He's from University of Pennsylvania Business School, but he pointed out we tend to measure the effects of decisions we make. We decided to do this and oh, we had this negative effect, but we never measure the, well, he uses his example, Polaroid had a chance to buy Xerox very cheaply in the 50s. They didn't do it. And Polaroid hardly even exists anymore, but nobody ever measured the impact of not purchasing Xerox. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, obviously that's not as easy. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's why we researchers have laboratories. You know, we, we're always assigning people in fake situations to, you know, half of them purchase Xerox and half don't, and we see how it turns out. But in real life, you probably have to commit to doing one or the other and you don't really know what the answer of what would have happened had we done this. You know, it's pretty, I don't know. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's not easy. And that's partly why we do case studies. We try to learn from what has happened uh, rather than even the bad situation, rather than what hasn't happened. But um, I agree with you and I agree with Acoff. You know, it would be great if we spend as much time thinking about what might have happened and what we could learn from what we, you know, missed doing as what we did. Well, John, I, I wanna, we're, we're a few minutes past our deadline and uh, I didn't wanna stifle any of this great conversation, but this it was a fascinating presentation. It's my second time seeing it. 
I can't thank you enough for being a friend and a partner of the community for human and organizational learning. And uh, this is uh, this has been a, a really a, a treat for me. And uh, the, you know, everyone who's interested in, in the numbers and seeing that dichotomy that you came out between oil and gas and uh, the power gem is uh, is, is amazing. And uh, are you are you okay with the uh, slides being shared, John? Yes, yeah, sure. And okay. uh, will I have access to the recordings? It, it, if nothing else, I'd like my co-authors to be able to see how I've butchered their work. Um, Absolutely. As soon as I as soon as I cut this off, then uh, it, it's our, it'll have been uh, re, they got they got to clean it up a little bit, but it'll go out to, uh, to everyone here. And uh, I'll also make sure that the slides uh, as well are distributed to the attendees and the registrants. Bob, so thank, thank you and the and CHOL for the opportunity and, and for your ably, you know, shepherding this and um, and being such a, a great moderator. And thanks uh, I, got, I, I got to say this and I'll say it in public, but I mean, <laughs> I always refer to the people of uh, your, your stature of uh, being like a smarticle particle, but I said, you're, you're the most down to earth smart guy that I know. You're so approachable and it's, it's, it's amazing. And that, 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 that means a lot to me because I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to ask the stupid questions to you because uh, you're, you're genuinely interested. So you're not you. fooling me. All you people who say you're asking stupid questions, you're not fooling me. <laughs> you're not stupid questions. Okay. With, with that, we will put this to an end. And uh, everybody have a great weekend. And uh, thank you for your uh, for attending this session. And thanks, John, for another fascinating presentation. Okay. Take thank care, you. everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.